Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be here. My name is Pastor Phil Diaz, of course, and I want to thank all of you for being here today at Green Castle Church of the Nazarene. And once more, we're going to give God praise. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's give praise. And so I want us to just take a moment and say hi to our E-Fam that's also watching online. Just say hi, E-Fam. Hi, E-Fam. Amen. Amen. If you are watching online, drop us a comment. Let us know where you're at and how we can best also pray for you. Today I'm excited because we're starting a new sermon series, and it's called Encountering Jesus. And we're going to be looking at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in the days ahead, leading all the way up to Good Friday, and then leading all the way up to his death on the cross, and of course, his resurrection that we celebrate every Easter and every day that we live and breathe. Amen? Amen. 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 And so I hope you're excited for this journey, and I hope that this is going to be uh, impactful, and I believe that God is going to be able to speak to us as we're in this sermon series, Encountering Jesus. So I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, we're going to encounter Jesus. We're going to encounter Jesus. Amen. You turn to your neighbor and say, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you first. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Amen. Because I'm hoping you have more than one neighbor. Amen. Man, if you're isolated, you need to, like, you know, pull in, okay? All right, amen. Okay, so here, I have a question for you here today. How many of you have ever heard of the name Joni Eckerson Tata? A few people, very good, okay. Woo, amen. All right, so if you don't know who she is, Joni was a very talented artist and athlete, and... Her story is this, she became paralyzed from the neck down after a a diving accident at the age of 17. And so all of her dreams, all of her hopes vanished in the glimpse of an eye. Being an artist, gone. Being an athlete, completely thrown out the window. Just simply being a normal teenager, nowhere. So her life was thrust into what we often call a wilderness experience where she faced immense physical and emotional challenges and felt as though her life could just be completely derailed. When we were here last week, we talked about revival. And last week, we talked about how it would be if we just all ended up in jail like Paul did. How many of us would be happy and singing praises to God if we ended up in jail? Amen? (laughs) Amen. You guys are still snickering about that. So, okay. (laughs) We're still chewing on that one. All right. But the question for me here today is how many of you would be happy if your life in this kind of way, not that you're cut off completely, but you feel like you got cut short of many opportunities in life? Amen? How many of you would be happy and content with that? You see, today we're going to be encountering Jesus, and we're going to be encountering him in a unique place today, because we're going to be encountering him also in a wilderness. The wilderness of life is a place of immense pain and also of immense darkness. It's a place where we feel like everything in our lives is dry, and everything in our lives is completely empty. It's a place where you're tested at every corner. It's a place where the devil only wants to steal from you. He only wants to kill you. And he only wants to destroy you where you're at. I can't imagine all of the things that Joni must have been going through in her own life when this had happened to her. In her own wilderness. Yet she went through this wilderness of life with faith. Let me ask you here today, how many of you have been in a wilderness season in your life? If not right now, maybe before. Amen? You've been in a place that just seemed so dry and so empty. You seemed in a place that just didn't have any sort of life to it. A place of isolation, uncertainty, and 
temptation. It could be that you're in a season of doubt and struggle and suffering. And perhaps you're even stuck in some sort of wilderness right now. And whatever wilderness you may be in today, I want to encourage you here today that you can encounter Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's give God praise for that. So today, we're going to encounter Jesus in his humanity and also within his deity. Because Jesus knows what it's like to be like you. He knows what it's like to face hunger, and exhaustion, vulnerability, and temptations. And yet he overcame all of this by relying on the word of God. And that's exactly where we're going to go next. Let's turn to the scriptures and let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 13. I'm excited about this word here today. I hope that you're excited also to listen and to receive. Let's read the word of God here today. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says this. It says, Jesus, who was full of the Holy Spirit. What was he full of? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. He left the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during these days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. At least that's what I think he sounded like. He sounded a little bit like that. But Jesus said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. And if you worship me, it will all be yours. And then Jesus answered and said, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. You're the Son of God, he said. Throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, and then will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And then Jesus answered, said, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all the tempting, he had left him until an opportune time. Let's bow our heads here today. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we come before you here today. And Lord, as we open up your word, we are praying, we are asking, Lord, that you begin to reveal it anew to us. Father, will you help us if we've been in this passage a hundred times before? Father, will you be able to help open this up in a way to where it is something new and fresh for us here today? Father, for those who have not heard this word before, I'm praying that right now your Holy Spirit just surround this individual, surround these people, Father. Will you just love and care for them, Father, and help open up their hearts and mind to receive in this word here today. I pray, Lord, that um, this word that I preach would be the things and, and the message, Father, that you would want your people to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated here today. Amen. <coughs> So my first point today that I simply want to bring up and talk about is we want to encounter Jesus today. And we're going to be looking at Jesus and his humanity. Jesus and his humanity. Luke chapter 4, 1 through 4, it simply says this, that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He left the Jordan. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for how many days? 40, 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. And then he ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And then Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. I want you to know something about this passage here today. This passage shows Jesus in his humanness. Amen? It shows him in his humanness. It shows him in being fully human and also fully God. But for just a moment, I want to take a look at some of his humanness. You see, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, yet he too was also led into a wilderness. And here's the interesting thing about what Jesus did in the wilderness. You would think that Jesus would want to build a church. You would think that Jesus would want to gather disciples or have them take communion or do a miracle. 
Because we see so many of those instances within the New Testament Gospels. But what Jesus did here to me is extremely fascinating. And it's interesting. Because he didn't stop to do anything like that. He did something crazy. And I'm going to say crazy because most people don't do this. We talked a little bit about it last week. But, you know, I don't know about you, but when you actually truly encounter Jesus, your life just gets flipped upside down. Amen? Yeah. And not for the worse, but for the better. You start to do things that are a little crazy to the world. So the thing that he did that really stuck out to me is he fasted. He fasted. And you're like, well, why do you think that's crazy? Well, it's crazy because if I took a survey, how many of you have fasted at least in the last, say, 10 days? I want you to look at the hands that are up. How many of you have fasted? Huh? You, yeah. That's why I say it's crazy. Because people think it's crazy. Fasting is this crazy thing. It's for those extreme Christians or for the super spiritual. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to debunk that right now. It is not for the super Christian. It is not for the super spiritual. This is what Jesus did to model for everybody who follows him. Amen? Amen. So I'm in a fast because I love coffee. Everyone knows that, right? I love coffee. I will buy you coffee. I want to supply you with coffee as best as I can. I'm a coffee dealer. I don't know. Maybe that's not a good thing. <laughs> but I have been fasting the things that I like to put in my coffee because sometimes I like a little sugar and cream. And, and what I have done is begin to fast the things that I I love. And why do you do that? It's because I love someone more. That's why I fast. I love someone more. And so I fast the little creams and the sugars and the, I don't know, all the flavored things. And the reason I do that, that may sound crazy, but the reason I do that is because for every time I think about wanting to put a sugar packet, I think about, no, I don't need to do that. I'm going to take this quick moment and I'm going to pray about that. And in that moment, I'm drawn closer to the Lord. Jesus fasted because I believe he was wanting to draw closer into the Father. Now, fasting is often associated with spiritual battles because it's a spiritual discipline that also involves denying oneself, denying the physical needs such as food in order to focus on prayer and seeking God's will. In the Bible, fasting is often used as a means of seeking God's guidance, seeking repentance, even seeking spiritual breakthroughs in difficult circumstances. Now, that should be able to preach to some of us here today. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so, fasting is this thing that I see that Jesus did, and it's a little crazy. If you're going to gear up for a battle with the devil, the first thing that may not come to mind is fasting. This is what Jesus did. Fasting is also a humbling experience that also reveals the areas in our life where we need to more or less fully rely on God's strength and grace. Yeah. Now the thing of it is, is, why would Jesus want to fast at a time like this? He knew that the devil was around the corner. He knew that he was going to try to throw his traps at him. Here's the reason. In Genesis, it talks about when Adam and Eve were created and how the garden was made and how the devil had tempted Adam and Eve. And Adam, Adam fell into sin because his, his wife Eve fell into sin first. She was tempted and then he gave into temptation to Jesus, being human, knew how easy it could be to be tempted. How many of you have temptations in your life today? Amen? How many of you have temptations? Okay? Yeah. We all do. So, this is so important because Jesus was getting ready to do a battle with the devil that hadn't been done before since the garden. Because Jesus, in his humanness, was the new Adam. And so he was getting to have round two of a battle with the devil. He was preparing for this battle. And here's the great thing about Jesus. Jesus wasn't going to fail. 
we read about that. It's interesting that Jesus chose to fast when facing his spiritual battles. How many of you just simply fast when you have a spiritual battle ahead? I think that there's so much that we can glean from Jesus' life that can speak to us here today. And here's the thing. He was just like us. He faced hunger. He faced vulnerability. And if given the chance, he probably would have had a schedule and everything else like we do. But he hadn't gotten to that part even of the ministry yet. What he was about ready to do was to prepare himself for the life and the ministry that was ahead. When I was preparing for ministry, my father-in-law, he told me this. He said, I want you to pray and fast about your calling. Not one and not the other, but both. And why? It's because you're spirit preparing for a spiritual life that's ahead. You don't see it where you're at, but it's ahead. You don't taste it yet, but it's ahead. You have to pray and you have to fast. Now why? It's because that time alone with God is so critical in learning how to hear who God really is and understanding who he is. You see, Jesus overcame temptation by the lying of the word of God. And he did that. He said, it is written that man should not live on bread alone. How many times in our wilderness experiences that we can also learn how to do the same? We may have taken a wrong turn, but we can always stop and say, okay, this is not right. I know I'm not going to live on bread alone, but by the very word that God speaks. But then how do we know what God speaks unless we learn how to listen and to hear and to obey? Amen? We can find strength and sustenance in the word of God, even when everything else around us is completely falling apart. How many of you, just right now, you're in a season, life just feels like things are falling apart. Things are just falling apart. It's okay to be honest in church, because if you can't be honest in church, where are you going to be honest then? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. That's right. Amen. Hey, I've got struggles. I've got, I've got things in my life that don't feel like they always add up like the little Lego blocks that we want to build in our lives sometimes. But here's the great news. No matter what wilderness that you're facing today, no matter what you're holding on to, God has got something better for you. And sometimes when we're tempted, we want to take the easy way. We want to take the shortcut. Because sometimes the temptation is so juicy, we, it's just the easiest thing to do for our lives. And that's exactly what the devil wants us to do. Sometimes the easy way is not always the right way. It's sometimes it's taking the hard right. And what I mean by that is sometimes doing the right thing is hard. And it's difficult. You see, the devil wanted Jesus to fall for the easy temptation. He had seen how hungry he was feeling, and so he offered a compromise. And today the devil, he does the same thing to you. He wants to offer you a compromise where you're at. If you just do this one little thing, oh, ain't no one's going to know. It's just between us. You see, God sees it. Oh, if you just tell this little white lie, no one's going to know. Oh, if you just decide to fall into this sinner, that you know, I'm going to know. It's just between us. God knows everything. And he doesn't want you to fall into the easy temptation. He doesn't want to compromise with the devil. What God wants to do is to be able to deliver you fully and freely from his traps. And today the devil may be doing the same thing to you. Here. This, it's easy. No one's gonna know. Yet the power isn't in the easy temptation. The power, and this piece of scripture is found in the Word of God. In 1 John 4 4, this is what it reminds me of. It says, You, dear children, are from God. This is for all of us here today. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 
Now that is a promise that you can bank on. That is a promise that you can take with you. That's a promise that you should be able to shout. That's a promise that should be able to give you victory. But everyone right now is looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> It's the truth. What happened to him? I'm going to tell you what happened to me. Jesus got a hold of me. That's what happened to me. And so I'm up here and I'm trying to just be excited for what God has done in my life and what I know He can do in your life. Give Him praise here today. Amen. All right, so that was, uh, I want to lead into my next point here. I want to talk about Jesus being in His deity. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, this is what it says. It says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all of their authority and splendor. It's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. You really think the devil's going to give up any of his power? I'm just trying to think about that right now. That's my side note commentary. And then he just said this, if you worship me, it will be all of yours. Jesus answered this, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is powerful for us here today. Because as we talked about the power of God, we also see the power of God working and moving in Jesus. Because he is God. You see, the devil tried to tempt Jesus with power and authority. That's like trying to tempt Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk with a million dollars. It's like a dollar to these guys. <laughs> and if I give you a million dollars, you're going to work for me. No, you're not. <laughs> Jesus knew all power, all glory, and all splendor, and all authority. And here's the thing. Because he knew what it, real power and splendor and authority was, Jesus refused to compromise his devotion to God. He knew that worship belongs to God and God only. How many Christians in the church would just be revolutionized with just that word being spoken over them? Because what you give value to is what worship is. Worship is more than singing. It's more than coming to church. It's more than just that. It is what you learn how to value in your life. And right now, there's so many people that want to value too many things all at the same time. And then on Sunday morning, they want to pull God from the shelf and say, I'm going to give you an hour of time today, Lord. But every other day of the week, I'm going to value everything else in my life. That's not worship. What worship is, is valuing him as top priority. In all circumstances, in all situations. And oftentimes the wilderness shows us what we value the most. We often value our money, our job, our resources. Now please take this. I'm not asking you to go quit your job. Okay? Nothing like that. But, but if we actually get down to the brass tacks, the things that we value come up in our lives. We value money over people. But we value relationships. <laughs> over genuineness sometimes. We value our own power and our own selfish needs at times. Yet, in all my time of pastoring and doing ministry, being selfish has never, <laughs> has never proved to be anything that's good for anyone in, in any sort of circumstance for any sort of time. It's not. It's just not. So, Here's the thing, in our lives, we need something bigger. I don't know about you, but I need something bigger to cling to. I need something bigger to hold on to. I need something to help get me through. And what that is, is Jesus Christ. So every time that I'm feeling even just a little bit low, every time that I'm feeling down and out, every time where I hear the enemy say to me that you can't do it, you're not enough, and all of these other lies that he wants to tell, this is where I need to be in the presence of God. And this is why worship is so important, because worship realigns our hearts to understanding what we need most, and what we need most in life is more of him. Amen. Amen. Give a praise, church. Amen. So unless God's our top priority, every kingdom that the devil shows us will always have strings attached to it as well. Do you know that? 
Every kingdom that he shows you will have a string attached that will lead to worshiping him more. Yes, you may not set up a satanic altar. <laughs> but what happens is, every time that you move farther away from God, you move closer into his presence, into the enemy's camp, and to be more like him. Whereas Jesus, in this short and simple phrase, in this, in this battle that he had with the devil, he showed where his heart and his priorities were. He rebuked the devil and all of his riches and kingdom. Jesus knew that what you really need isn't more fame, isn't more fortune, and you don't surely need a thousand more TikTok followers and all of that. Here's what you really need in life. You need salvation. You need righteousness, holiness, and most importantly, you need to have a way to the Father. And that is the mission and purpose of why Jesus came to earth, so he could provide all of those things that the world can never provide. Your money can never buy you enough holiness. Your money can never buy you enough of God's love. Your money can never buy you enough righteousness. It can buy things to make you look that way on the outside, but it can never buy you what Jesus did for you for free on the cross. And that's why, amen, that's why we celebrate. So in our wilderness experiences, we have to trust that Jesus is the one who has the ultimate power. That Jesus is the one who has the ultimate authority over all things. And we have to trust that he's the one who can bring order into the chaos of who we are in life. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And he's the only one that can turn our mourning and dance. And our sadness and gladness. Jesus is the one who has that power. Give him praise to him this morning. Amen. Amen. My third point here is this. There might be some of us that just feel completely stuck where we're at. But I want you to know today that there is hope. There's hope for those that might be stuck in some sort of wilderness in life. And Luke 4, 9 through 13, it said this. The devil led him, Jesus, to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, it said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Remember when I told you the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy you? I believe that he wanted to destroy and kill Jesus before he could even make it to the cross. Amen? But then Jesus had those powerful words to say, don't put the Lord your God to the test. You see, the devil, he continued to tempt Jesus. And Jesus resisted. He defeated him. And the reason he defeated him is because he stood on the solid rock of the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. That should preach to us here today on what we should be standing on. We all say, I have my own truth. My truth is my truth, and since it's my truth, my truth is better than your truth. I say, what is red is blue, and what is blue is red. I don't care, because it's my truth. Postmodernism 101. Here's the thing. In life, life, there's real truth. Up in the galaxy, and the stars far, far away from here, there's physics and mathematics, the proportions of which I don't even understand. I can't compute, and I don't even know how it all works. And even the best of us on this planet who knows how the intricacies of these things are put together and they work, they still take a moment, they look at their board, and they're amazed because look at all the intricacies of what the universe takes to work every single day. The galaxy, the universe, the sun, the planets, the moon, the star, all of these things, they never call in to work at all. They work in the way that only God can make it work. I want to say this to you today. If the God who made all of that... <laughs> The God who put all of that together. The God 
who could see into the past and the future and everything else. The same God who made you and me. He didn't die for a planet, stars, and galaxies. He came as a man, fully man, fully God, to die on the cross for you. To do what? What to save us? To give us the things that we can never give to ourselves. But he, he did all of that so that you wouldn't have to go through the wilderness that you're in. He did that so that you could come out of the wilderness that you found yourself in. Jesus emerged from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit to begin his ministry. And for us, I truly believe there's hope. Whatever wilderness we're in, because Jesus has overcome all of He's overcome all temptations. And he offers us his same power, his same presence to help us navigate our struggles. He understands what we're going through. So many times in life, we feel like God is out there in that space that we just talked about. He's so far away and he's so distant. But that is not who God is. Who God is is he's a loving and caring God who came and he sent his one and only son to die a horrible, terrible death. For you and for me and the person sitting next to you and the person that you can't get along with, the person who drives you crazy, which might be me. But he died for all of us. Amen. 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 Give him glory and praise. This time I want to have the praise team just come up for a moment. And as they're getting ready here today, I just want us just to be able just to stand and... um, I just want you to know this. As we all journey through life, we all face our own wilderness experiences. And in the midst of our struggles, here's the great thing that I want you to know today is that you can't encounter Jesus Christ in your own life. You can find hope and power in his presence knowing that he has overcome temptation, knowing that his divine authority can be the same authority and grounding power within your life. Because the same power that took a borrowed, a savior from a borrowed grave is the same power that runs through you here today. Amen? And so what I would like us to do today is this. I just want us to be able to find a way to respond to the Lord. Remember Joni from earlier? You know, she initially struggled with anger and depression and despair. She was in her own wilderness. She felt as though God had abandoned her and had overwhelmed her by the pain and isolation that she experienced. But through her struggles, here's the thing. Joni encountered Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And she met him in a very powerful way. And she wrote this in her book, In the midst of my pain, I found myself drawn to the one who could understand my suffering, the one who had suffered for me. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know of anyone that has died for me other than Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't know of anyone else who took time out of their life to do such a great work and deed for mine. And this is what Joni realized. She began to draw closer to God. She began to study his word. She began to actually seek his presence in her life. She began using her artistic talents again in a way that she could never imagine. And she began to create beautiful paintings and began to inspire others with disabilities. She founded Joni and Friends, which is a ministry dedicated to serving people with disabilities around the world. Has written all kinds of books, spoken to audiences around the globe. Because through her own wilderness experience, Joni has come to life in Christ. And she found the true meaning and purpose of her life and hope in her struggles. She's touched countless lives with the testimony of faith and perseverance. And I believe her story is a reminder for all of us here today. That even in the darkest moments, that even in the darkest times of whatever we're facing, that God can use us where we're at. 
There's so many people that I talk to that I could talk to who about them. God can't use me. Look at me. Look at my age. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. God can't use me. You don't understand me, Pastor. You don't understand my past. I was involved in drugs and drinking and all this other craziness. God couldn't use someone like me. Oh, you don't understand it. I used to be in church all the time, and I was a I was a youth leader, but then I just got so uh, filled with doubt and discouragement, I left the church, so God could never use me. I don't know what your situation is, but here's what I do know. I do know that God is here and ready to work here today. Amen. So we're going to sing a song, and what I want you to do is to find your battleground here today. I'm inviting you into that. Our altars are open. You can come. You can stand. You can sit. It's whatever posture. Even in your seat where you're at, God is ready to work and to move. So here's all I'm asking is that as we sing this, I want you just to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine the ground that you're standing on. This is your battleground. And today, your battleground has these lines that are drawn. And you can step over the lines as many times as you want to because God gives you a free will. You can keep stepping into all the traps of the enemy. You can keep stepping into all of the lies. You can keep stepping into all of those things. But I believe God's got something better for you in your life other than the traps and the snares. I believe that God has a ground that he wants you to stand on today that's filled with holiness, that's filled with love, that's filled with compassion, that's filled with a ground, with a line that gives you the boundaries to know where you belong and where you can go and follow. And so I want us to take this moment today to take inventory of our lives. So as the worship team sings today, just let's, let's bow our heads today. If you feel like you want to respond to God, I'm here. I want to pray for you. If you can just raise your hand, I'll go to you where you're at in your seat today. And pray. Let's just sing it today. Let's draw our lines and see. Amen. Jesus. 
your love, my spirit. Let's just bow our heads today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your presence filling this room today. We thank you, God, for your works to be done within this place. God, I'm praying that as we leave, that our, our steps don't leave the holy ground, that, Lord, that you are giving to us here today. The ground, Father, that, that we walk, when we have you within our lives, Lord, it becomes holy for every step that we take. So, Father, my prayer is that you impact your people here today with these thoughts and with these, these things in mind, Father, Lord, that you can help us, Lord Jesus, within our life, through our struggles and temptations. Help us to live a life, Lord, that's pleasing to you. Pray this in the name of Jesus, all God's people say. Amen, amen. I love you all. You guys are dismissed today. And don't forget, 6.30, we're going to be on the mobile sanctuary on Facebook Live. Love to see you then. You guys take care. Love you all. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.